It's Labor Day weekend. For most Americans, it's a long weekend before the school year really gets going. A chance to cash in on retail sales and holiday promotions. And one last chance to soak up the summer sun before the leaves change and the air gets cold. But the original intention of Labor Day was, in the words of Labor Day founding father Peter J. McGuire, to honor those who from rude nature have delved and carved all the grandeur we behold. You know, workers. People who build, drive, and serve. Nurses, teachers, and firefighters. The folks we've all deemed essential since COVID shut us down. There's still work to do, but the rights of workers have come a long way since the first Labor Day weekend, 126 years ago. So today, we're talking about labor, unions, and the dignity of work. Checking in with the essential workers who keep this country going. They want people to take loads for cheaper. It's been horrible trying to make ends meet, especially being an owner-operator of this truck. Reckoning with the rise of technology and its implication for workers. We had a very transparent pay model before. On this algorithm-based pay model, you have no idea. And a big crazy number that American workers will definitely want to hear. Because the desire for a safe, fair-paying job is something we all have in common. Earlier this year on More in Common, we spoke to the unsung heroes of the pandemic, truckers hauling essential goods around the country. So I'm putting in about 14 hours a day, and I'm running about 700, 750 miles. But while the pandemic continues, has the respect for essential workers remained? We checked in to find out. My name is Ryan Hicks. I've been driving trucks over the road for past six years. In the very beginning, it was really nice. We were getting a lot of miles. We were doing a lot of loads, state to state, all day. People were just so excited about truck drivers. Thank you all for being here as we celebrate some of the heroes of our nation's great struggle against the coronavirus, our brave, bold, and incredible truckers. Now what has actually changed is, you know, so many people has like gotten the COVID, all these places that had all these loads that needed to be delivered have actually kind of slowed down. The pay's dropped a little bit. They want people to take loads for cheaper. It's uh, uh, It's been horrible trying to, to make ends meet, especially being an owner operator of this truck. A lot of people are not really worried about, you know, the healthcare workers anymore that much, or they're not trying to help truckers out and get some food here and there. We were uh, all super essential in the beginning. We're just not getting the help anymore. I've talked to a bunch of truck drivers on, on, on forums and, and on social media. A lot of them were taking a stand, saying that we didn't want to take any cheaper cheaper rates. The other trucks, the other truckers that really just don't care, they just want the load, you know, they'll just work it for, they'll work it for 70 cents. Only thing you can do on that is just not take the load. Just take a stand, take a strike, like they did over in Washington. And they took a strike. They just, they just dropped off all the trailers and just parked right there on the main road and said, we ain't gonna take another load until you bring it back up. All the truckers really would stand together as a one and be united as one, then yes, it would be way better than what it is. Federal labor laws are supposed to protect all workers. Well, almost all. This constitutional loophole has left religious workers feeling forgotten. Religion should not be used as a sword, as a license to discriminate. People who think that religious freedom is the most important value above anything and everything else most likely don't really understand their own religion. When you are using, manipulating the law to basically do things to your employees that are harmful, and that is completely contrary to any sort of authentic religious mission. The ministerial exemption is a doctrine that judges have created to describe an exception to our civil rights laws. It says that the First Amendment gives religious liberty protections to religious employers, which means that if there are employees who have any religious functions, they qualify as ministers and therefore are not covered by employment laws. What it means for this set of employees is that they may have to endure discrimination and harassment based on sex or disability or age or race. So when I was teaching religious studies at this Catholic high school, a student illegally accessed OkCupid, the well-known dating website, discovered I was gay, and then outed me to the school. After that, there was a campaign of harassment that Began. Um, I went to the administration to say, look, this goes against our non-harassment policy and against our school mission, and I was told that I was a problem. 
when I filed this charge of discrimination, the school then responded and said, you shouldn't even be like taking this into consideration because this guy's a minister. We have the right basically to do whatever we want. As someone who's openly gay, I would never be ordained. So in one and the same time, I'm not able to actually be a true minister in my faith. But then the school would use the term minister to block me from bringing a lawsuit against it for disregarding its own mission, its own non-discrimination policy, and harassing me. So originally the idea of the ministerial exception is that it was this very tight group of people, of faith leaders within a school or another institution. That expansion of who is a part of the faith leadership is now so big it really can be anyone employed. It might mean that someone who is paid less because of their race has no recourse because the employer can then go and say, sorry, I'm immune from our civil rights laws and you're not protected because you're a part of the faith leadership. You have freedom of religion, but that freedom does not give you a license to discriminate against anyone else. And it certainly, as an employer, does not give you the right to oppress your workers. Religious employers should deeply respect and love their employees. I would say that, you know, any religion that values using the blood force of a legal loophole is not really a religion worth being part of. And so it's really going to be up to uh, religious employees to band together, to find that solidarity, to stick together, and to really organize themselves hard. And that's a difficult thing to ask of them, but that's what needs to be done. And now for a few workers who go well beyond their job description. Starting with this UPS driver down in New Orleans who stops to talk to every dog in the neighborhood, taking pictures, and making a lot of new friends along the way. A photo with them. And, and that's basically how a pup from Jade works. <laughs> and now you need to meet this mother who works as a nurse and comes home after a long shift to a family that celebrates her like this. Love the love of that family. <laughs> and here are some Illinois educators who are packing up lunches for their students, going above just giving food for the mind providing a little food for the body as well. I like that kind of food just as much. And here's another nurse who gets an applause from the entire neighborhood. Yes. And a huge shout out to this FedEx worker who sanitizes every package before he delivers it to this young girl with an autoimmune disease. Coming up after the break. Effective immediately, we're going to put a scaled policy into place and we're going to have a minimum uh, $70,000 pay rate for everyone that works here. And later. I believe that we're not asking for anything that's unreasonable. Plus this week's big crazy number. So in 2015, I decided every single person at my company would make a minimum of $70,000 per year. So multiple people, about a third of the company, got their pay doubled. Effective immediately, we're going to put a scaled policy into place and we're going to have a minimum uh, $70,000 pay rate for everyone that works here. In the five years since we've implemented the $70,000 minimum wage, the number of babies born per year went up 10x. The number of people buying homes for the first time went up 10x. A third of the company got completely out of debt and two thirds paid down debt in some way, shape or form. On average, people doubled their savings for retirement. We had multiple people say that they had lost 100 pounds, beat cancer. Like we've experienced that as a Gravity family. And we've done it just by the simple way of just paying people what they deserve. Once this new policy was initiated and our salary was increased, I was able to save more money for my daughter's uh, you know, future uh, college tuition. Also, I had some personal goals where I wanted to you know, move into a, a more comfortable place for my family and be able to afford that. Before, there were times where I'd worry about, you know, hey, am I gonna be able to make this bill or am I you know, gonna have to postpone it? Um, now, it feels like I'm definitely more in the comfort level of, hey, I'll, I'll be okay. At the end of the day, who wants to be worrying about, you know, am I going to be able to make ends meet, put food on the table next week? Some things that you just don't want to be thinking about while you're trying to remain efficient during your workday. It's been an incredible revelation, and the, there's absolute proof there because our turnover rate got cut in half, and we've been able to triple the size of the company and triple the number of customers 
that we've been able to help just in the last five years. You know, it's proof that this will work. It's proof that it can work. It's proof that every company should at least go in this direction. But you don't have to be a genius to know that people working hard to build a company should have enough money to live their lives. In fact, I think any five or six or seven year old would know that. And so we have all these like institutions and business school and all these business books that tell you, no, the things that you knew when you were seven years old aren't true anymore. Now you have to do something that was clearly wrong about like being selfish, taking everything for yourself. And I think those those ideas, you know, were set up to prop up a system that's just kind of obviously wrong. I, I want to put a smile on everyone's face and make them feel like it's a genuine thing we're doing because that's what I'm about, you know, is genuine love, genuine passion for what you do. And when you put those two things together without the financial stress, wonderful things happen. So if you're part of a society, if you're part of a country, a city, a company where people generally have their needs met and are independent, it makes your life better. And I got that. So maybe I gave up some of my power, but that power was not a, a healthy, positive, happy power. It was a power that really didn't belong to me. And all of a sudden I can just be myself. Because so many of America's restaurant workers rely on tips, their wages can differ from day to day and week to week. Some are thinking there may be a better solution. You're talking about the nation's second largest and fastest growing industry, almost 14 million workers. Almost one in 10 American workers currently works in restaurants. Yet despite the industry's size and its growth, it continued to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. What's important to note is that the restaurant industry is now the only industry on earth that gets away with saying we shouldn't have to pay our own workers' wages. You pay our workers' wages for us. And it turns out that the Restaurant Association has been around not 50 or 60 years as I originally thought, but 150 years since emancipation of slavery. The notion changed at emancipation when large numbers of freed slaves went to find work and the restaurant lobby didn't want to have to pay them being black. And so they said, well, we should just be able to let them live entirely on tips, which was a mutation of the notion of tipping, which was meant to be an extra or a bonus, not the wage itself. And that idea of tips as wage replacement, not a supplement to wages, became law in 1938 as part of the New Deal, when everybody got the right to a minimum wage for the first time, except for groups of black workers, domestic workers, farm workers, and tipped workers who were told, you get a zero dollar wage as long as tips bring you to the full minimum wage. There are seven states, including California, Washington, Oregon, Nevada, Minnesota, Montana, and Alaska, that got rid of this system many decades ago and have a full minimum wage with tips on top. Los Angeles, like New York, it's too expensive. My waitresses are more than minimum wage. Uh, people who are working in the kitchen and working in the store, much more than that. And it's not a good respect for them, too. I mean, how can they respect you if you don't respect them? That base wage of 2 or $3 plus tips, which are always, you know, poorly, roughly calculated. It's very hard, really, and messy to calculate tips. In combination, that base wage and tips is too low to meet the minimum threshold in most states to qualify as unemployment insurance at the state level, which then disqualifies them for unemployment insurance at the federal level. So the employer has to care about the $2 worker and the consumer has to care both about the small business and the $2 worker. We all have to care about each other. Coming up. In January of this year, SHIP made a transitional change on the pay model for various different cities. Um, on this algorithm-based pay model, you have no idea. And then labor unions built America. Labor unions were responsible for the 40-hour work week with time and a half for overtime. Labor unions were responsible for unemployment insurance, social security. Modern gig workers are not direct employees of a company. They're usually on platforms that use apps and various like pricing and dispatching algorithmic structures to determine wages. The gig economy in the context that it's most often talked about is presented as though it's some sort of like innovative and new 
structure of work or way of receiving goods and services, the reality is, is that unfortunately this business model is over a hundred years old and highly exploitative. I became a ship shopper back in November of 2019, uh, late part of October, first part of November. We had a very transparent pay model before. We could see exactly what it was. And if the customer added more items to an order, we would get paid more. It was commission based. In January of this year, SHIP made a transitional change on the pay model for various different cities. Um, on this algorithm based pay model, you have no idea. Certain apps, are sort of do this black box algorithmic pay model where they don't really explain how they're calculating pay. If you get, you're able to at first pay people well, a lot of people will join the app, and then as you slowly, you know, hook people in and they sh sh form or shape their lives around it, you start um, lowering their wages, and it's hard for them to back out. One of the things that I found was that the majority of ship, of ship shoppers or gig workers in general, they're afraid to speak out. A lot of the ways gig workers organize is on social media groups. So the main way that the company too sort of creates high morale and a network of people is on online on Facebook. The company censors, they will either remove the post if it's critical of the company or they'll turn off the comment section. In some cases, when a shopper says something that they think is too aggressive, they'll deactivate them, which is essentially firing them. So at Gig Workers Collective, we aim to empower workers and um, help them with the infrastructure building that's necessary to do organizing in the gig economy, because it is so different than organizing um, a traditional workplace. I believe that we're not asking for anything that's unreasonable. Um, we've, we've asked for basic protections. We want to be classified correctly. If you're not going to want to classify us as employees and treat us as independent contractors. So let us do the things that we know that we can do as entrepreneurs and um, elevate our own businesses the way that we want to elevate them. Before we go to break, let's dive into the data. This week's big crazy number is 10%. That's the share of American workers who are represented by an organized labor union. That's down from about 20% in the 1980s. It's down almost 30% since the 1950s. Compare that to European countries like Sweden, Finland, and Denmark, where the share of workers in unions today is over 60%, or two out of every three workers. So what does that mean for workers? In Sweden and Denmark, workers get a guaranteed minimum of 25 days paid leave, and Finns get 30. That's not counting holidays. In the US, there's no guaranteed minimum, though government surveys indicate companies provide an average of about 10 paid days off. What about parental leave? The shortest among the European countries is 27 weeks of paid time off that Denmark gives new moms. It's 35 weeks in Sweden and 40 in Finland. In the US, there's no mandated minimum, and the US government says surveys of employers and workers indicate that fewer than one in five Americans have access to paid parental leave. When it comes to health care, all three of those countries provide universal health care through the government. In the US, the best available numbers show that 49% of Americans have health care via work and they're paying, on average, about 20 to 30% of the premiums. For a typical family plan, that's around $7,000 as of 2019. Coming up, the past, present, and future of organized labor. Of all industrialized countries, we are the most unequal in terms of income and wealth. One of the key factors that is responsible for that growing inequality, and that is the decline of organized labor. We've got to have stronger labor unions in terms of making sure that this economy is working for the many, not the few. Labor Day used to be a celebration of organized labor. I mean, that's really what Labor Day was all about. Today, we just look upon it as a three-day weekend. Labor unions built America. Labor unions were responsible for the 40-hour work week with time and a half for overtime. Labor unions were responsible for unemployment insurance, social security, for a lot of the things that we take for granted. And without labor unions, none of that would have been enacted. Of all industrialized countries, we are the most unequal 
in terms of income and wealth. One of the key factors that is responsible for that growing inequality, and that is the decline of organized labor. We've got to have stronger labor unions in terms of making sure that this economy is working for the many, not the few. American workers in the 1950s and 60s had a lot of bargaining power to get good wages because about a third of all of the workers in the private sector were in labor unions. Today, we're down to 6.4% of private sector workers are unionized. I mean, that means almost no bargaining power at all. For the past 40 years, the typical American worker has seen no increase in his or her wage whatsoever, even though the economy is almost twice as large. That is a huge problem. It's not just widening inequality. It means that you got more and more of the gains of the economy in the hands of fewer and fewer people at the top. Unions negotiate on behalf of, of the workers for a living wage, for benefits, for better salaries, for health insurance. They give workers a voice. A lot of powerful people do not one union. We are there to ensure that workers' rights are protected. The biggest companies in America that are the most profitable right now, that are really cleaning up in this pandemic, these companies are anti-union. Look, it's nice to appreciate essential workers, but if they don't have any bargaining power, they are not going to get the essential personal protective equipment they need. They're not even going to get sick leave, paid sick leave. That's what's happening across the country. You've got big corporations who say all the right things, but are not providing their warehouse workers with nearly the protections and the pay they deserve. Here in California, we work to ensure that paid sick leave was going to include and not exclude farm workers. Many of the farms, when the workers test positive, if they're sick, they get fired. That is criminal. That is criminal. This is a pandemic. This is affecting all of us. Farm workers, we need them there because if they're not healthy, they're not harvesting our food, we're not going to have food on our tables. Forget about the work that they do. They're human beings. They need these protections. So we cannot just say, use the word essential without all the responsibilities that come with it for those workers. And the big danger today is that average working people and the working poor do not have a voice. I mean, the point is really that the economy exists for us. We don't exist for the economy. Thanks so much for watching our show today and remembering this Labor Day weekend that we have more in common than we think. I'm Michael Koenigs, and there's a lot more of this show and others on the ABC Localish Network.